Well, welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining us here today. You have myself, Dr. Brittany Volk, you have Dr. Sarah Hallberg, you have Dr. Amy McKenzie, and Dr. Jeff Stanley. We are all here from Verta Health and are excited to share with you a bit about our treatment today. Um, just a few things before we get started. You, at any point, uh, may enter questions into the chat box that you see on your screen. If you'd like to remain anonymous, please feel free to hit that little button that says submit anonymously uh, and your name will not be shown. Of course, it can be shown. That's completely up to you, but we encourage you to ask us any sorts of questions that you'd like. We will answer them at the very end of the webinar with the exception of Dr. Hallberg's section. We're gonna ask that when she presents, if you have questions specifically for Dr. Hallberg, that you enter them immediately during her section so that she can get to them at the end because she has to drop off here. So she won't be with us until the very end. But for the rest of us, um, we, will, we will join you again at the end of the session all together and answer your questions. So encourage you to put those questions in the chat box. All right, well again, welcome everyone. Um, just to get us kicked off here, we're super excited with the recent press release that the VA has put out announcing the partnership with Verta, which is a treatment to reverse type 2 diabetes. We're clinically proven and, you know, we do so safely and sustainably without medications or surgeries. And so I just want to set context, though, for reversal because many of you on the line here today probably work with patients with diabetes and our definition of reversal, which you'll hear several times today, means that our patients are able to receive glycemic control as measured by an A1C below that diabetic threshold of 6.5, while also getting off of all diabetes-specific medications. So that's our definition of reversal, and we're really excited to partner with the VA to offer this to the first 400 veterans that are eligible. Now, this cost to eligible veterans is completely covered. So there may be small out-of-pocket costs um, for some of the screening, mostly the EKG that's involved, but other than that, this is completely covered for those who are eligible. Now, eligibility for these first 400 veterans enrolled through a health plan through the VHA, they must have a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, be between the ages of 18 and 69, and prescribed at least one anti-diabetic medication other than metformin, and importantly, have access to a smartphone, tablet, or computer because that is how we administer our treatment. So for safety reasons, we want to make sure we have that good communication set up. Now, there's no formal uh, referral required. What we are going to ask is that if you have a patient who may be a great candidate for this treatment, you send them to this website, vertahealth.com forward slash veterans, and they begin the enrollment process. We take over from there every step of the way from enrollment to reversal. We will take over at that point. So you send people to the site and then we'll handle it from there. All right. Now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Sarah Holberg, who is going to talk to us about the history and science of carbohydrate restriction to, re to treat type 2 diabetes. So Dr. Holberg. Thank you so much. Um, and I want to say thank you so much for um, joining us here today. Um, we are very excited um, for this partnership and hope that after this uh, video presentation today, you have a better understanding of exactly what we do and what there is to offer to your patients. So once again, my name is Dr. Sarah Hallberg, and I am one of the medical directors here at Verta Health, and I'm also the PI of our large clinical trial, um, which began at my role at Indiana University Health. Um, where I am still the medical director of the medically supervised weight loss program and also um, have been a primary care physician there um, prior to this new role um, for almost a decade. So I understand any of you who are in that role and some of the challenges that um, primary care presents these days. So why are we even here today and, and interested in this? And that's because we have a huge problem in this country. Over 50% of the adults in this country have diabetes or prediabetes. I and mean, that's a very staggering and really scary number. And even new evidence shows that it's 
worse than that even because a new um, study just came out looking at, okay, so diabetes and prediabetes, those are sort of at the end of the spectrum, but what about earlier on in meta metabolic disease? And so we took a look at NHANES data to see how many adults in this country have some form of metabolic disease by going um, with the criteria for metabolic syndrome. And um, again, talk about scary. The results of this show that only 12% of adults in this country are in optimal metabolic health. And of course, we think of normal weight adults being safe from this, but actually less than one third of normal weight adults were metabolically healthy. So of course, we see this rampantly in our obese population, but it's also hiding in those who are normal weight as well. So, but we can do something about this epidemic. And let's face it, we have to do something about this epidemic. It's crushing um, our patient's quality of life and we can no longer afford it. And what we can do is let everyone know and then help our patients and guide them to ways to reverse type two diabetes. So we've got to get that news out that type two diabetes is a reversible condition. And there's really three clinically proven ways to reverse diabetes, and that's through bariatric surgery, a very low calorie restricted diet, or a low carbohydrate diet, which is what we're here to talk to you about today. So low carbohydrate, and that will be again the focus of the rest of this webinar. So I wanted to start out with some basic, you know, why does this work? And so for some review of basic nutrition and nutrition physiology, and we have four macronutrient categories, carbs, fat, proteins, and of course, alcohol. We won't talk too much about alcohol today, other than small amounts of alcohol are allowed on the Verda treatment. But we're gonna focus on the food section. And so this is a really important graph to understand the differences between carbohydrates, proteins, and fat when it comes to glucose and fonts. So we have to remember, you know, the problem with type 2 diabetes is that people have elevated blood sugar. But of course, before their blood sugar elevates, even pre-diabetes level, what we see is that they have had elevated insulin levels for years or decades. So the fact of the matter is carbohydrates cause our blood sugar and insulin to go up. They do in everyone, but of course this rise is more exaggerated and tends to last longer in people who have metabolic disease. And the more down the spectrum of metabolic disease we get, um, the more the rise goes and the extension of the rise lasts. And the other really important part here is fat. And fat does not cause a glucose or an insulin spike, not at all. And so when we look at this graph, we can really say, well, wait a minute, so what should we be asking our patients with diabetes to eat? And of course, we know for decades, we've been putting them on a low fat, high carbohydrate diet. And when we think about the physiology behind this, we can really understand why that has not been successful. What we really want to guide our patients is to be eating things that aren't going to cause their blood sugar or insulin to go up. And that would be reducing significantly the amount of carbohydrate in their diet and actually increasing the fat they consume. And one of the other things to remember is that insulin is our fat storage hormone. When our insulin rises, it's essentially telling our body store for a rainy day and store we do. And really people's response to carbohydrates is very different. So here is a picture of someone who is insulin sensitive on the left or has a high carbohydrate tolerance. When they eat what we consider a healthy carb, which a cup of brown rice actually has 45 grams of carbohydrate, that person on the left is going to mount an insulin response. They have to when they consume carbohydrates like that to help push the glucose into the cells where it can be used. Um, but they're not going to mount that much of an insulin response because they're so sensitive to small amounts of insulin. But the poor person on the right here has a low carbohydrate tolerance or is insulin resistant. And with the exact same amount of carbohydrates, that person is going to mount an insulin response. But in order to successfully push the glucose into the cells where it can be used, 
because they're resistant to that insulin, they're going to have to produce more and more and more and more as their disease progresses. And this is going to create two really big problems in the long term. Number one is that they've had these very high levels of insulin, our fat storage hormone, around for so long. And we can start to understand why very often weight gain actually precedes carbohydrate, um, excuse me, precedes the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. And second, because their body, especially their pancreas, has had to be overworked to put out all of these high levels of insulin for so long, it can tucker out. And of course, that's when we really start to see the blood sugars rise, is when the pancreas can no longer keep up with the um, stress that's been put on it. So what's our traditional approach to treating this disease? Well, we give people medications to indirectly reduce their blood sugar, or we give them medications to increase their insulin, either through exogenous in insulin injections or through medications, again, that are forcing their pancreas, their already overworked pancreas, to put out even more insulin. And when we really think about that, you know, all we're doing essentially for these patients who are stuck in this vicious cycle of diabetes is we're really pushing on the gas pedal and we're speeding up the cycle. Um, right here is not a long-term solution for anything except for worsening of disease. We need to start attacking the disease at its root cause. So one of the questions that we get all the time is, well, wait a minute, if our patients are reducing carbohydrates, um, will they have no energy? And the fact of the matter is not only will they have plenty of energy, they're gonna have a much more consistent source of energy. We all know the energy source from carbohydrates, which exists as a peak and then a trough, and a peak and a trough all day long. But our patients are getting energy from two really important sources. They're getting energy from the fat that they consume, but they're also getting energy from the fat that they already have stored. And what happens when we reduce carbohydrates and our insulin level falls, and we stop getting out of the storage mode and into the mode to use fat, in the liver, both of these sources of fat go in and they make ketones. And it turns out that ketones are a really great source of consistent energy. And in fact, they are preferred energy for some really important parts of us, like our brain and our heart. So our patients have plenty of energy. They just get it, again, in a much more consistent fashion. Um, so one of the concerns people have right away when they hear about ketosis, or we like to call it nutritional ketosis, um, is that they think of diabetic ketoacidosis. And this slide here, I hope, helps people to understand that these are totally different conditions. I mean, talk about the end of the spectrum. So nutritional ketosis begins with a beta-hydroxybutyrate level of about 0.5 millimole. And in the absolute best patients who maybe after exercise and who are doing an unbelievable job at carbohydrate restriction, we might get patients up to three millimoles. We very rarely see that outside of true athletes um, who have just exercised, but that would generally be the ceiling. And of course, what we're talking about with ketoacidosis is completely at the other end of the spectrum. Um, where we see, you know, huge uh, increases in beta-hydroxybutyrate uh, at 10 to 20 millimoles. So once again, um, the idea of nutritionally induced uh, ketosis is very low on the spectrum. And unless someone is totally insulin um, deficient, uh, again, not in the type 2 diabetes population, um, and then they're not taking insulin, we don't run into a problem. Um, in fact, we're always encouraging our patients to try to get their ketone levels up a little bit higher, but we don't ever see them at the other end of the spectrum. Um, so one of the other things that I think is really important to mention as we get into this today is the new science of beta-hydroxybutyrate. So what we're trying to get patients to achieve with the elevated levels of beta-hydroxybutyrate not only contributes to weight loss and their um, glucose control, 
but also recent uh, studies have found that beta hydroxybutyrate is actually a hormone and it is a potent gene regulator. And we understand its mechanisms on decreasing inflammation so much that we not only have the clinical evidence, but once again, we have the basic science understanding of how that actually works. So once again, an extra added bonus um, based on new science um, for your patients as well. Um, and one other thing that we hear sometimes is that, you know, carbohydrate restriction is a fad diet. And, you know, I would say, you know, this has been around for over 100 years, um, you know, probably a lot longer than that. This is anything but a fad diet. Um, in fact, this was used before we had exogenous insulin for patients, um, even in the type 1 population by the father of diabetes, um, which is um, Elliot uh, Joslin. So even he used this again, over 100 years ago. We got away from it when we had more and more medications um, that we could offer people. But once again, now we're at a point where we say enough medication is enough. And we're really going back to the basics here and utilizing food as medicine. So another important thing to understand is that low carbohydrate is now within the standard of care. Been part of the new science, and we were cited um, with the guideline changes in both the standard of care um, and the new nutrition recommendations by the American Diabetes Association. Our study has been cited um, uh, to go along with the change. And the other thing is that the VA and the uh, Department of Defense actually have been on top of this for even longer. So they have endorsed carbohydrate intake as low as 14% since 2017. And so now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Amy McKenzie. But before I do, if anyone has any questions for me before I have to run off, I would be happy to answer them. All right, Dr. Hallberg, I am just going to check our question box. We have one question. Let me see if it's for you. Hmm. All right, our Q and A is not popping up, so uh, if you could just wait one moment, Dr. Stanley, I, oh, I, you see the questions? You know what? I can see it. All right, great. Go ahead. Okay, sorry, I didn't even try. Okay, um, will you be collecting any data on the enrolled veterans for research purposes? And actually, I am going to let um, Dr. Amy um, handle that question. I think she has more information on exactly um, what that's going to be. So we will definitely get to that question at the end. Um, and our website security certificate is not available. Okay, we will get back to you on that one. I'm, I'm sorry that that's out of my area of expertise, but um, I'll be happy to make sure that we get that answered for you. Um, and would you not worry about a low carbohydrate diet for patients on basal bolus insulin, insulin regimen due to the risk of hypoglycemia? That is a great question, and I'm so happy that you, answer, uh, that you asked that question. So the answer is absolutely. And that is a huge part of how our program and system works is precisely based on that question. Um, and that is because we have a very sophisticated remote care um, feedback loop to ensure that we are adjusting medications efficaciously um, and safely. And so that's why each uh, participant, as you will hear about more later, gets their own Verda physician who will be working with them literally an almost real time basis to ensure that patients um, do not have hypoglycemia um, as their medications are being reduced. And we have an amazing track record on this. And as far as um, how do patients fare with constipation is another question. Um, and actually they do very well if um, you know, any individual patient happens to have an issue with that. Um, once again, we have an entire protocol in place to assist with that. Um, 
someone else asked if the slides will be available after the call, and I don't see any reason why we wouldn't want to do that. Um, and uh, then there is a question of expand on the inflammatory role of insulin. Um, so what I will say is that there are plenty of studies showing that insulin is pro-inflammatory. Um, so decrease in insulin, no doubt, is part of the reason that we have a decrease on inflammation. But like I said, we really have a very good detailed understanding of the role beta hydroxybutyrate also plays in decreasing um, uh, inflammation. Um, what is the longest time a patient remains in ketosis? Are they keto cycling? And well, we have plenty of people who have been in uh, nutritional ketosis for decades, actually. Um, but I will let, um, that's going to be discussed a little bit more in detail um, about the personalization of this um, in the lecture. So I will let um, the other speakers um, handle that. Um, last question that I will quickly address, and then I think it's going to be discussed um, later also, is probably stop SGLT2 inhibitors early. And the answer to that is correct. We do. We always start S or stop SGLT2 inhibitors um, before they begin the verta treatment because those medications um, can cause diabetic ketoacidosis, as I'm sure you are all aware. But once again, to reiterate, as far as just dietary intervention, we don't uh, run into that. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Hall. I know that. Uh, you have to get off, and we're going to get a Dr. McKenzie on here. So, Dr. McKenzie, over to you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There we go. Sorry, technology issues. Um, hi, everyone. I'm really excited to be here today. My name is Amy McKenzie. I am a senior research scientist at Verda, and I'm really excited to talk to you about some of the research that we've done on our treatment. Um, <laughs> I received my PhD at UConn. My research background is largely focused on the interaction of nutrients and physiology. And at Verda, I've been involved with the clinical trial um, that I'm going to share with you today that Dr. Halberg is the PI on. And uh, at Verda, I'm also the PI on the registry that we've established. So the question that was just asked um, about doing research, um, what we've established is a registry where every patient of Verda's, um, whether they come from the VA or any other source, um, they are given the opportunity to choose if they would like to share their data with us for research purposes. So everyone is asked and they give their informed consent if they agree to share their data with us. And then everyone who participates, um, from there we can use their data for research purposes. So we have ongoing research on all of our, um, on all of our real world evidence to say outside of the clinical trial setting as well. Okay, so today I'm gonna to share with you a little bit about the published outcomes from the clinical trial that we began in 2015, which we like to refer to as the Indiana Diabetes Reversal Study. And since then, we've published five manuscripts from this trial. The data have demonstrated Virtus treatment um, rapidly reverses hyperglycemia, necessitating this deprescription of glycemic control meds, and that these improvements in diabetes are sustained for one year. Beyond our impact on type two diabetes, the research also demonstrates that the Verda treatment can positively impact related conditions like obesity, risk factors for cardiovascular disease, markers of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and patient reported sleep quality. With this evidence and the many years of research, to be honest, contributed by other research groups, the 2019 ADA standards of medical care acknowledged for the first time the utility and benefit of carbohydrate restriction um, nutrition therapy for reducing glycemia and the medications to control blood glucose and cited our research among others in support of that conclusion. And we're very excited to share that um, a manuscript that shows that Verda's impact on diabetes at two years after starting treatment with us is now in press. It's accepted and in press um, at Frontiers in Endocrinology, although they have already published the abstract and I'll speak a little bit um, today about the information that's in the abstract and the full text will be posted soon. So let me set you up to understand our clinical trial. We originally designed this study as a two-year prospective, non-randomized controlled trial. And we ultimately decided that we needed to extend this to five years 
Um, and we did that for the participants who were in the VERTA treatment arm, um, but not for the usual care arm. So now we're in our, we're currently um, collecting data at three and a half years since we started this in 2015. We enrolled 378 patients with type 2 diabetes and prediabetes who selected to receive treatment uh, within this new care model that we developed that we've heard a little bit about today. This care model uses carbohydrate restriction as nutrition therapy, and a physician-led care team delivers that therapy through a continuous remote care platform. 262 of those 378 patients had type 2 diabetes, and those are the patients and the outcomes that I'm going to focus on with you today. We also enrolled 87 patients with type 2 diabetes who selected to receive um, the standard and usual care for diabetes, and we recruited them from the same geographical location, and we recruited them prospectively as an observational comparison group. The usual care participants were recently referred to a local brick and mortar clinic to begin a diabetes education program, um, which provided counseling by registered dietitians according to ADA standards of care at the time, uh, which didn't include carbohydrate restriction as a therapeutic option. And the staff from our research team had no role in their care and all of their care was provided by their own PCPs and endocrinologists. To give you an idea of what the average participant looked like, the average age uh, was 54 years old. Uh, the average participant had a BMI of 40, starting weight of 257 pounds. Two thirds of them were female. Um, and a few other important characteristics to point out about this population. One is that the average time since diagnosis was eight years. 55% um, of our participants were diagnosed more than six years ago. Um, so these aren't recently um, diagnosed patients with type two. They've definitely um, have been living with this disease for a long time. Another is that we also accepted patients who were prescribed insulin, uh, which is a little bit unusual compared to some of the other studies that have been done in this area. And about 30% of our patients with type two came to us um, using insulin at the beginning of the trial. And it's also, I think, important to note that we recruited this study in Lafayette, Indiana. The geographical area there is quite diverse when it comes to socioeconomic characteristics. And that was definitely reflected in our patient population. A lot of times when I um, talk to others about our study, the question that I get is, you know, what were the occupations of your participants? Um, and they were quite varied. So just some examples that I have in mind, people were, there were people who were unable to work, there were people who were retired. People worked um, in factories, in offices, farmers, um, business owners, and even professors, and, and even uh, actually a few veterans. So fast forward one year after we started the trial, and here's a summary of some of the main outcomes. When these patients started, they had type 2 diabetes for eight years, had an average A1C of 7.6, and 88% of them took medication to help control blood sugar. One year later, A1C declined by more than one point, and 60% of patients completing one year of the trial were reverse diabetes. Britt mentioned this before, um, so just as a reminder, what we mean by diabetes reversal is that they reversed hyperglycemia to a point where A1C was less than 6.5 without the use of diabetes-specific meds. Um, so in our case, we're excluding met metformin from that. And in addition to the improvements in blood glucose, patients also lost 12% of their body weight on average and improved most risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Retention, particularly in the context of um, interventions that require lifestyle change, retention in this study I think was very high with 83% of the participants still enrolled in the study at one year. Some of the potential reasons for this higher rate um, compared to some other studies might be the, the patient perceived benefit of um, observing themselves improve their health, individualized continuity of care um, from our care model and being able to work with a physician and a health coach, the relationship that the patients build with their care team, the ongoing education and some social support from their peers, and the, the ongoing use of biometric feedback that we're using to tailor the treatment to the patient um, and to monitor them for safety. And then with respect to adherence, when we're talking about carbohydrate restriction, this was evident through the presence of increased concentrations of blood beta hydroxybutyrate. Most participants achieved nutritional ketosis induced by this carbohydrate restriction and maintained an elevated um, blood ketone level at one year. And it, this indicates sustainability and it also possibly enabled the use, the, it also might have been enabled by the use of ketones to be a um, daily Bio, a bit daily biomarker of feedback to help the patients understand um, how they were doing. 
Hemoglobin A1C, I think of this as a, a cornerstone um, classically in the care of type 2 diabetes. And in participants that were treated by Verda with our carbohydrate restricted nutrition therapy and through our continuous remote care model, A1C declined 1.3. On average, insulin resistance measured by HOMA IR uh, improved as well. And these improvements necessitated the reduction in many, and in many cases, eliminations of glycemic control meds, allowing patients to receive to reach the point of diabetes reversal. And 60% of patients completing one year met the criteria for diabetes reversal. And I had mentioned the <coughs> sorry, um, I mentioned the the need to step down medications as the blood glucose rapidly improves. Uh, most medications were reduced or eliminated. Here you see at one year into treatment, sulfonylureas, 100% uh, of sulfonylureas and most of the SGLT2s were discontinued. 94% of patients taking insulin were able to reduce or eliminate its use entirely. So 48% completely discontinued use of insulin, 48, six, sorry, 46% um, were able to reduce their daily dosage, and they reduced it by nearly half compared to what they started with. Um, and from a safety perspective, obviously reducing um, the use of insulin and sulfonylureas is going to contribute to the, reducing the risk of hypoglycemic events. And I'd like to come back to A1C for a minute because I think this is really important. Clinically, we're often very concerned about patients with higher starting A1Cs because of the association between A1C and greater risk of comorbidities and complications of diabetes. Um, after we put out the paper, um, I took a little bit of a closer look at this. So we did a post hoc analysis of patients with different levels of glycemic control when they enrolled in the study. Among patients who came to us with an A1C of nine or more, these patients were able to reduce A1C by 3.5, and many of them were able to do so while eliminating medications. Um, among this group, inflammation, blood pressure, and markers of atherogenic dyslipidemia, all of those improved as well. So here we see that the Verda treatment allowed the higher risk patients to um, regain glycemic control and move into a lower risk category for complications. Another interesting detail that I noticed in this analysis was that patients that started with an A1C of nine or more also had diabetes for 11 years on average. So it highlights um, that our treatment is able to positively impact some of the sickest patients who have had diabetes for quite some time. And then I mentioned meds before. So we did another post hoc um, analysis where we looked at patients who were taking medication other than metformin, so the same group that's um, going to be enrolled from the VA. And this took a look at this group. Like the patients starting with high A1Cs, this group also had a longer average duration of diabetes, 12 years since diagnosis. Um, and within this subgroup, definitely able to reduce A1C by 1.4. 64% um, the prescriptions other than metformin were eliminated. 42% of them were able to achieve reversal. Uh, this, this group also improved all of the characteristics of metabolic syndrome and lost 12% of their body weight. Um, and coming back to weight specifically, the primary focus of Virtus treatment has largely been around regaining blood glucose control and weight loss um, obviously is an important component of many, patient, many patients' treatment programs. Um, Following one year of treatment, intent to treat analyses showed a mean weight loss of 12%. Here, what I'm showing you in this graph is the daily weight change among one year completers of the trial, who averaged 13% weight loss at one year. 5% um, I, I know many clinicians use as a, as a goal for clinically significant weight loss. And among the one year completers, 80% uh, of the participants lost more than 5%, and 54% of participants lost more than 10% of their body weight one year into treatment. In cardiovascular disease, of course, in diabetes care, we're always paying attention to cardiovascular risk factors. So in another one of our manuscripts, we focus specifically on these outcomes. Many of the markers that we assessed, um, this is just a few that I selected, um, are shown along the x-axis here, and their percent change from baseline is shown along the y. To quickly show you um, what direction these markers moved, um, the percent change is shown if the risk marker uh, risk factor improved, the percent change is shown above the zero line. And if the marker worsened, then it's shown below the zero line. And all of Verda's uh, results are shown in blue. So the participants in the Verda treatment arm 
Most cardiovascular disease risk factors significantly improved at one year, including triglycerides, HDL, cholesterol, um, inflammation, blood pressure, and many of these contributed to a reduction in the 10-year ASCVD risk score at one year. But you'll notice, of course, that one risk factor, LDL cholesterol, moved in the wrong direction. And while LDL-C is commonly used um, as a marker of cardiovascular risk because of its association um, with many cardiovascular events, Research also suggests that ApoB and LDL particle number are at least as good of indicators of cardiovascular risk as LDL cholesterol. And despite the increase in LDL-C that we observed, patients receiving Virtus treatment saw no change in ApoB or LDL particle number following one year of treatment. I think the other thing to consider um, is all of the other risk factors beyond LDL, like inflammation, um, uh, high sensitivity C-reactive protein decreased, white blood cell uh, decreased, uh, atherogenic dyslipidemia improved. So all of the risk factors taken together, the majority of risk factors improved and overall cardiovascular risk doesn't appear to have increased following one year of this intervention. And this was exactly the, the consensus that was reached in a recent um, expert consensus report on nutrition therapy for diabetes that was published uh, just this month in Diabetes Care. I apologize, I think I'm losing my voice, so I hope that you can hear me. Um, as you know, many patients with type 2 diabetes also live with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So we also performed a post hoc assessment of markers of non-alcoholic fatty liver. And in this analysis, we used non-invasive surrogate scores to identify suspected steatosis with uh, non-alcoholic non liver fat score and suspected fibrosis with the NAFLD liver fibrosis score. Based on these sur surrogate scores, significantly fewer patients were suspected to have steatosis and fibrosis after one year of treatment. We also considered the proportion of patients with abnormal ALT at baseline and found that the number of patients with abnormal ALT also significantly declined. Another focus of care for patients with type 2 is uh, often sleep, sleep duration, sleep quality. So we assessed patient reported sleep quality with the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index and found significant improvements in the global PSQI score and also in three of the seven components of the global score. And those three components were sleep quality, sleep disturbance, and daytime dysfunction. And often when um, I talk about our research, a lot of people say, you know, well, what happened to the 40% who didn't reverse? Um, and I think that's a, a great question. So I sat down and we did another post-hoc analysis on that, and here's what we found. Among the patients that didn't meet the criteria for reversal, so A1C less than 6.5 and um, no diabetes-specific meds, we still saw um, an improvement in A1C. A1C was reduced by 1.2 down to an average of 7. And that also allowed elimination of medications for some people, including insulin. Uh, participants lost nearly 10% of their starting weight, reduced triglycerides, and improved their 10-year uh, uh, cardiovascular risk score. And the last thought that I'll leave with you today is the effects of Virtus treatment in comparison to several other non-surgical interventions for type 2, and a glimpse into uh, some of the two-year outcomes that are accepted in press at Frontiers in endocrinology. Uh, in research to date on carbohydrate restriction, um, low and very low carbohydrate diets like the recent direct study, and also intensive lifestyle interventions like Look Ahead, uh, it's not uncommon with these lifestyle interventions to see rebound in weight or rebound in A1C even within the first year after starting a treatment like this. And Virtus treatment demonstrates further improvement from 10 weeks to one year with sustained clinical improvements in A1C and weight at two years compared to where they enrolled. Um, so here we're showing you um, the data out to two years um, that's going to come out in Frontiers in Endocrinology very soon. So I'll end with that and uh, say thank you for your time, and I will turn it over to Dr. Jeff Stanley. All right, well, uh, thank you, Amy, and uh, thank you everyone for uh, sticking with us through the presentation here. So again, I'm, I'm Jeff Stanley, and I'm gonna be talking about uh, deprescribing medications and working with external healthcare providers. 
for just a little bit of brief background on myself. So I have been uh, a physician now with Verda for uh, nearly four years. Uh, I'm a medical director and I've also been a practicing physician. I'm licensed in all 50 states and have treated thousands of our patients and helped them to normalize their A1C and to reduce their medications. Uh, before I joined Verda, I was a primary care physician for a number of years with uh, Kaiser Permanente. And so I, I feel like I have a, a good understanding of the experience of a primary care doc and really want to work hard to make sure that our team communicates well with the, the primary physicians and specialists of our patients and to make sure we have a, a good ongoing communication. Um, in addition, I have a real soft spot for the VA. Uh, my wife has been a VA physician for nearly a decade now. Um, and selfishly, I'm, little, I'm definitely excited to be able to work with uh, vets again moving forward here. So the first section that I really want to concentrate on here is around rapid medication reduction. So I want to show you some of the data as to how quickly the medication reductions can occur. Uh, and then also, also show you some of the safety measures that we have in place to avoid hypoglycemia, keep patients safe, and have them uh, experience a real kind of gradual and, and improvement in their blood glucose. So this is a, a graph that's taken from our clinical trial, um, but it's a little bit of a different way of looking at the medication reductions that Dr. McKenzie discussed. And what we see in this graph is on the x-axis, we see that uh, 360 days, so this is from the one-year paper, and then on the y-axis, we see the percentage change of starting users by drug class. And there's a couple of things that really jump out and a couple of points I really wanted to make about that. So first of all, what you can see here is that a large percentage of the medication reductions are occurring in the first 30 to 60 days. And the reason for that is, again, when people are adopting a low carbohydrate dietary approach, they're seeing rapid improvements in blood glucose. And in order to keep them safe and, and avoid symptomatic hypoglycemia, we need to be really on top of things and safely uh, and sy uh, systematically reduce medications. And so in, in this graph, what you can see here again is that medications like sulfonylureas and SGLT2 inhibitors uh, were reduced pretty rapidly. Um, and again, this is in the clinical trial, but this is pretty on par with our, our practice with our standard patient population. Um, and then we also see rapid improvements in uh, insulin and DPP-4 medications. Uh, now you will note here that there was, after a temporary reduction in GLP-1s, at least in the clinical trial population, there was a, a slight increase in GLP-1s for a while. A lot of that ended up being personal practice preference of the physicians running the trial. And in some cases that was used to help people to you know, lose more weight or get off of insulin. That's not a standard practice we use, but we are able to, again, personalize things to help patients be the most successful. And the other thing, again, that I would point out is that despite these rapid and you know, pretty dramatic re medication reductions in the first you know, 90 to 120 days, uh, we still saw large A1C improvements. So this was concurrent with medication reductions. There were nice uh, A1C improvements as well. So to take a step back though and think about how can we make these medication reductions safely, um, you know, the, the platform that we use to do this is really through our digital medicine platform, which enables patient level innovation in a, interventions that are delivered in real time. Uh, so what does that mean? So first of all, we have algorithmic prioritization of patients. And what that means is that, you know, we have a machine learning algorithm that is able to take the data from our patients. So the complexity of their medical history, uh, the amount of medications that they're on, the specific medications such as insulin or even you know, U500 insulin. And they're basically given a, a attention score which alerts our physicians to patients who are high acuity and also are having rapid improvements in their blood glucose. So we have this force ranked list that's able to alert our physicians at any time that there's a patient that needs to have a medication reduction. Um, in addition, uh, we have this delivery of real-time clinical alerts. And what this looks like, again, is beyond the you know, noting that a patient is high acuity, this also allows us to get an alert if someone has either a high glucose or a low glucose, or let's say they log other symptoms. Um, in addition, we also are alerted to you know, issues such as if they haven't logged in a while. 
or maybe they're starting to regain weight a little bit and use that to help our coaches drive some improvements in dietary adherence to get the results that they're looking for. Um, and then finally, some suggested interventions based on all patient data. So because we're able to you know, learn from the thousands of patients that we're treating, we're able to uh, help our coaches to be more um, on point in terms of helping a patient who's running into a rough stretch. Because we've seen that so many times, we can intervene before the patient regains significant weight or before they have that big spike in blood glucose. But now to, to take a look at some of the guiding principles of deprescribing. De um, so I want to, I'm not going to go into all the details of how we reduce medications. Uh, we're going to have a, a, a future webinar where we'll go into a lot more of the nitty gritty of this. Um, but I wanted to give you a basic idea of you know, the, the big picture things that we're really focused on in terms of patient safety and outcomes. Um, and then also give you some ideas as to how we, we view this medication adjustment period. So first of all, uh, of course, this should go without saying, but the goal is to avoid hypoglycemia at all costs. You know, that's obviously the most uh, acutely dangerous thing that can happen when someone is making really any dietary change, whether that's a low calorie diet or a plant-based diet or, uh, you know, after bariatric surgery, you know, you're going to want to watch very closely, of course, so that people are not having symptomatic hypoglycemia. Um, now, the next thing is we want to monitor biomarkers and symptoms and intervene quickly with a tight feedback loop. So because we're able to get these glucose values, ketone values, blood pressure in real time, we're able to uh, anticipate as a patient is improving quickly and needs to have a medication change. Um, and then finally, we really want to respect individual patient goals and preferences. And this is something that I've really learned over time in having so many conversations with patients is that obviously you have some patients whose main goal far and away is to uh, avoid the complications of diabetes, have the tightest glucose control possible. We have other patients, and we all know these patients, who their absolute goal is to get off medications. And we want to tailor our approach towards the individual patient goals. Now, of course, we're not just going to take someone off medications because that's, you know, their goal. Um, they have to be in a, in a state where their A1C is improved and glucose is improved and they're, they're ready. Now, I'm going to go briefly through a, a handful of medications and just give you an idea as to how we address these. So first of all, for long-acting insulin. Um, one thing that we do is we monitor glucose prior to dietary changes to help direct the insulin reduction. So several days before someone makes any changes in their diet, and we always tell people be very careful and don't start dietary changes before you're being supervised closely, because I've seen people who, who come to us who have tried this on their own, and without stopping their insulin, they can run into hypoglycemia. So we're getting these baseline values to help drive our initial med uh, changes. Um, then when a patient is going to start dietary changes, we have them start on a predetermined day. So, we, so everyone is on the same page. The patient knows, the doctor, the coach. And then we have intensive monitoring in place. So people are monitoring their glucose you know, three, four times a day or more, um, or we're hooked up to their continuous glucometer, and we're watching closely. And I've honestly um, seen a fair, you know, fair number of times where we're reducing insulin or other medications a few times a day within that first you know, couple you know, day period or, or week period. Um, and then again, the ongoing medication reductions are based on glucose values and also really importantly on trends. So what that means, again, if somebody has a glucose of 150, that may be you know, fantastic. But if their glucose was 300 yesterday, we need to watch really closely and see whether further medication reductions are needed um, in kind of anticipation of that glucose lowering further. Uh, next for prandial insulin. Uh, so I think this was actually brought up in one of the questions. So, you know, this is generally one of the first medications we reduce or stop. And the reason for that is this can pose a high risk of hypoglycemia, as a lot of our patients really see the significantly reduced postprandial glucose excursions. So if you're not eating a lot of carbohydrates uh, with meals, we don't see those typical spikes after each meal. And because of that, most people tend to do fine on long-acting insulin alone or a significantly reduced prandial insulin. 
Um, and then in some cases, we'll continue some PRN insulin as needed in patients who either have some dietary indiscretions or who still, for whatever reason, will have you know, some, some episodes of hyperglycemia. Uh, next, uh, next insulin. So this, this is a medic. These group of medications um, tend to be poorly compatible with low carbohydrate nutrition. Uh, again, because the prandial needs reduce quickly, but sometimes the long-acting insulin needs take longer to reduce, and so there can be a mismatch between meal time and. Um, glucose values and fasting values. Um, so we often consider switching to long-acting insulin only, or again, just monitoring um, very closely. Next with sulfonylureas. Uh, so obviously these have a relatively high risk of hypoglycemia, not as high as with insulin, um, but they do also have a risk of weight gain. And of course, you've probably seen some of the um, potential associations with mortality in folks using these. Um, so this is one we tend to take off, uh, but one consideration that's actually been very interesting is that they can be effective in a subset of MODI patients uh, who in these, in these patients, basically it helps them to make a little more insulin and they may be able to delay or even avoid the use of insulin. Um, so we consider a trial in select cases, but again, this isn't something we frequently use. Uh, now the big one, which again came up in one of the questions I saw, is with the SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, and we really advise people to be careful with these. Uh, one of the issues with that is, of course, the, the potential risk of euglycemic DKA. Now, this is something that's been coming up in, in case reports, um, but there was, I think, also a mention in the recent uh, diabetes guidelines. And basically, the concern is that in, in concert with a low-carbohydrate dietary approach, there may be a risk for folks to have too high of ketones. And again, that tends to be more the case in people with insulin deficiency, but it's certainly definitely important to keep on your radar. Um, also, you know, we've, we've seen this recent black box warning for amputation risk with canaglyphosin, so we discuss that with patients. And our approach is generally to stop this prior to dietary um, changes to allow the levels to decrease and avoid, um, again, uh, ele too elevated levels of, of ketones. We consider restarting it with careful monitoring, um, but again, this is something I think is very specific to our approach and that we're able to monitor ketones daily, uh, blood beta hydroxybutyrate, and so we have a very quick feedback loop if ketones are to increase. Uh, and then finally, you know, there, it, there has been, of course, seen some evidence of cardiac mortality benefit with some of the SGLT2 inhibitors. So we, we do have a, a risk benefit discussion with patients to give them idea of, again, both the pros and the potential cons. Uh, now for the GLP-1 agonists and DPP-4 inhibitors. Uh, these are, again, medications that will generally continue for at least three months uh, because it can be helpful with weight loss and also seems to be helpful in getting people off of insulin. Uh, there's a very low risk of hypoglycemia or side effects, and this tends to be very much based on patient preference. So their, their A1C level, um, again, their, their overall preference if they really want to get off all meds. And then finally, metformin. So this is one that, that comes up frequently uh, because it's a medication that we tend to continue in patients. Um, and there's a few reasons for that. So, um, you know, it's well tolerated and safe in general. Uh, it's being used in prediabetes, PCOS, and other comorbid conditions. And so we don't want to, you know, take people off this for the sake of, you know, saying that they're off all medications. Um, we find that a lot of people would prefer to, re to remain on these medications. And, you know, again, because of its use in prediabetes, um, it's a reasonable medication to continue. All right, so I know that was a bit of a whirlwind tour of medication changes. I'm happy to answer more questions during the Q&A section. Uh, but now I wanna focus a little bit on communication uh, with, us, with our providers. So the, the big take home point here is really that we aim to be additive to the patient's existing care team. And the way that we do this, again, is through physician-led monitoring. So we're a physician-led practice. We're licensed to practice medicine in all 50 states and have a professional corporation. And we're able to offer a level of patient monitoring, safety, and prescription management that no other diabetes program can at this point. And again, in my experience as a primary care physician, you know, even with knowing the benefits of this dietary approach, it's just I didn't have the time or the resources to be able to monitor patients as closely as I would like. And we really function as a specialty provider. 
So remember that a strong relationship between a patient and their PCP is, is paramount to what we're doing. And as a specialty provider, we're providing supplementary care that's focused on diabetes treatment. So we're not taking over primary care. Um, we work to partner with PCPs and other specialists and to really work on ensuring uh, the proper pair, uh, care coordination. And briefly, I'll go into how we aim to do this. Uh, so we communicate proactively with regular provider reports, uh, starting with an intro letter, ongoing progress report, and as needed alerts and consults. To dive into that a little more, so first of all, for the intro letter, uh, VertiFax is a letter that introduces the Verta treatment to the treatment team uh, for all patients during enrollment. Um, again, the patient decides to enroll in Verta, so it's not, you know, um, entered through a referral, um, but we do work to get an ROI and to update the primary care physicians of our patients. Uh, next, we uh, send regular progress reports. And basically these are faxed at 30, 60, and 90 days, and then every 90 days thereafter. And these reports have results from any lab tests, uh, general progress in terms of glucose improvement, A1C improvement, and so forth. Um, and then current medication lists, and important again, any, any medication changes um, that are made. And again, those medication changes are done for safety reasons. So we, if we're reducing me uh, medications like insulin, it's to avoid hypoglycemia. And then finally, in terms of alerts or consults, so in emergent situations, uh, we'll contact the provider's office on an as-needed basis, and we um, providers can always contact through our 24-7 on-call phone line, and you can see the number there. Um, in addition, we'll give you the email contact at the end, but you can email providers at vertahealth.com, and someone will respond to you quickly with um, any to answer any questions you might have. Here's just an example uh, report that we would send to the provider, again, with information such as blood glucose control, uh, medication changes, labs, and so forth. And we work to coordinate care with PCPs and specialist providers. Um, and, you know, again, we want to maintain the primary care provider relationship. Uh, what we're hoping for is better outcomes and also time management for the primary care docs of our patients. So we know that this is a really busy job and that, you know, you don't always have time to spend the individual time to talk about lifestyle changes with patients. And so we're able to take on some of that. And the idea is that we return the patients to you uh, healthier, on less medications, um, and, you know, generally pretty happy. And with this ongoing reporting, we're able to basically can collaborate on medication change, safely reduce medication, and be in touch. Uh, so now I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Dr. Volk, and she's going to tell you a little bit about the patient experience. Great. Thank you, Dr. Stanley. And before I do, I just want to share with you that um, Dr. Stanley mentioned if you have any questions, you can email providers at vertahealth.com. If your question has not gotten answered or does not get answered before you need to drop off here. Um, please, please submit that question uh, as well as if you think of anything after. And then for any patients, they can direct questions to support at vertahealth.com. So with that, I am going to, I know we're at the top of the hour, but I'm going to share with you for those who want to stay on the line, um, the patient experience on Verta. So a little bit about how we work here at Verta. Um, and what we do for the patients. So I'm Dr. Brittany Volk, uh, probably the third time I introduced myself now. I am a research, researcher, a registered dietitian, and um, most importantly, what I do here at Verda is really uh, educate our patients and work on our clinical education team to work directly with our patients to live this lifestyle and make it something sustainable for them. And really how we work is through two innovations, Verda Reverse, which is our clinically proven treatment, which I think uh, by now we've shared some of the science with you. Um, it's based on decades of research as we, as we had shared. And then how we deliver that treatment is through our continuous remote care. As Dr. Stanley mentioned, we have our licensed providers and health coaches that are really giving real-time care individually, but also doing this at scale. And many patients, frankly, when they come to Verda, when they hear of Verda, they don't know that diabetes can be reversed because up until now, they've really been focusing on managing their condition uh, through medications, through monitoring blood sugars. Of course, prevention is great when possible, but we're showing patients that we can help them to reverse their diabetes. And as they're making nutrition changes, 
with the help of their care team, you know, who's also guiding them in the medication changes through feedback that patients are providing to us in the app. Um, that really allows us to provide this day-to-day -day care, as Dr. Stanley alluded to. And as he also mentioned, you know, we're taking over this day-to-day -day diabetes management, but also connecting with existing providers to really treat the patient as a whole. And I really want to stress this um, integrated technology platform that we have. And the reason I do this is because we are constantly monitoring patients. The cellularly connected devices that we provide to patients allow them to measure things like blood sugar and their body weight and things that will automatically um, or that will go into the app. The communication that they have in the app helps them to make changes in their lifestyle and their nutrition that are then sustainable because they have a care team behind them on the other side of the app. So it's this kind of integrated technology that allows us to, to really work with patients uh, day to day, almost minute by minute for some. Again, that website for those who are interested in joining our treatment, please go to vertahealth.com forward slash veterans. Somebody had submitted that they weren't able to get to the page, but you should have no problem if you try again. So vertahealth.com forward slash veterans. So this is how patients will begin the application process. So if you have a patient who is interested or may be eligible or you just want them to find out more, please send them to this link and we'll take over from there. So patients will fill out some basic information and they will then be assigned an enrollment advisor. This is gonna be their single point of contact on the Verta team to be able to reach out to and ensure that their enrollment process goes smoothly and just be able to answer any questions that your veterans may have about the treatment. Now we'll be collecting their medical history, we'll ask them to have labs done throughout the enrollment process, and then the last step is their their telehealth visit with their Verda provider. Now here you can see Dr. Stanley on the screen meeting with his patient, um, just as you would in your office, except it's done through the convenience of the patient's own home. And so these, this visit is the last step in the enrollment process, as well as patients can meet with their provider again on an ongoing basis, but this is at the very start of their treatment. Now, once they're approved for the treatment, they will receive a starter kit. And in this kit contains everything that they will need to monitor their progress on Verda and to allow us to make the recommendations that we uh, make both you know, nutritionally and medically so that we can personalize their treatment. In it, you'll see a cellularly connected scale with the weights automatically uploading to the patient's app. Uh, they receive a glucometer along with all of the testing strips for both glucose and ketones. And again, I stress they'll receive all of the supplies needed for an entire year. They then get onto the app and they meet their Verta Health Coach. This is the person that is going to be their champion and be their source of support and be on the front lines with them, really communicating day to day with the patient, guiding them through the reversal process. Now education is really important to us here at Verda and we want to empower our patients to understand the treatment fully before they engage in the treatment. So before making dietary changes, before making lifestyle changes, we take time to make sure that the patient is educated, not just on what to eat, but also why, as well as what they can expect to happen. They're gonna be learning things about their carbohydrate restriction. Um, they're gonna be learning how to eat until they're satisfied, which is a new concept for many, not walking around hungry all day long. They're going to learn to do this without having to calorie count. They'll see those improvements in blood sugar. They'll see the weight loss without counting calories and without having to exercise. So these are some key components of the program. Do we think exercise is great for a lot of reasons? Yes. But in order to reverse their diabetes and gain control of metabolic health, it's not a requirement on Verda, and especially not at the very start. 
Now remember, we're trying to de-prescribe those medications and we're using instead food as medicine. And I wanna give you a snapshot of some of the delicious foods that our patients can choose to consume. We're not giving them an exact meal plan that they need to follow. We want to find what's going to work for each person based on their preferences, their lifestyle, and of course, considering their medical history and then how they're responding to the treatment, we can make adjustments throughout. So the individualized component to this is really important. And again, we have that day-to-day -day interaction with the patient so we can make these changes very quickly. We're talking to patients through the app and connecting with them, asking them how they're doing, their health coach, um, health coach and the health coach and the patient are gonna be able to communicate via text just as you know you would almost text a friend. So if a patient has a question, if they're at a restaurant, they're not sure what to order off the menu, I mean the range of questions we can work with um, through the app is incredible and we're there for the patient in every way. Because our goal is to achieve glycemic control, again, without medications. Remember that when um, or when, when our patients begin the treatment and as they progress through the treatment, this becomes a key component, biomarker entry. So entering things like ketones and glucose and weight into the app and blood pressure for those on blood pressure medications or have high blood pressure, this biomarker entry is a critical component because this is what we then are, allowed, are, are able to reach out and make those real-time changes in medications as well as those nutrition modifications and we can monitor a patient's progress from the very first day that they enroll in the treatment and see their entire history and you as their providers can also then get this information as dr stanley mentioned um, we'll be sending regular follow-ups but again this right here this biomarker tracking is key to our treatment now as patients enter their biomarkers we're seeing them in real time and they're getting prioritized on our list so that if some patients come in on insulin, we're able to maybe put them to the higher prioritization if we see a tremendous improvement in their blood sugar from maybe one reading to the, the previous few readings. Our system is going to prioritize that so that our, our providers can make quick and rapid changes to their medication regimen. And we have regular lab follow-ups. So in addition to that baseline lab work, we're going to start regular or do regular follow-ups starting in about six months and then as needed for that patient. And we, as Dr. Stanley mentioned, are going to be communicating your patient's progress back to you. And again, we take over that day-to-day -day diabetes management. So when they come to you, they can come with the lower blood sugar, the better A1C, um, blood pressure off of some medications. But you'll already know this at that point because we're going to be communicating those changes to you. And you know, this is a really important process. Uh, a lot happens between the point of enrollment, which I shared, uh, to the point of reversal and even beyond reversal. It's really important for our patients. It's important to us. It's important to you as their primary care providers and other providers. And it's just a really uh, exciting day when the day we can get a patient off of any medication, but especially insulin and reverse their type two diabetes. But of course it goes beyond just reversing diabetes because we want to keep patients healthy for a lifetime. And so it's about maintaining that reversal. And, and part of maintaining that reversal is, of course, the ongoing support they get from a team of health coaches and a team of providers and the ongoing education that they get in the app and things they can work on like sleep and stress levels. But it's also about the community support that they get from other Verta patients right in the app. So they can join an online community that's private only to other Verta patients and where they continue to support one another and really maintain this lifestyle that keeps them living a life free of type 2 diabetes. And so with that, I just want to thank you for joining us before we get to questions and also announce that um, Dr. Stanley, Dr. Halberg, Dr. McKenzie, and myself will be giving a longer version of this presentation on July 11th through the ADA. So if you're interested in hearing this information and more, please join us by registering uh, through vertahealth.com forward slash ADA. So thank you so much for your time. I'm going to bring back 
Dr. McKenzie and uh, Dr. Stanley, and also remind you of these important links here, vertahealth.com forward slash veterans for patients interested. Uh, providers who have questions, please go to the email you see on the screen here. And if any of your patients have questions, they can email support at vertahealth.com. So Dr. Stanley, I'm gonna rely on you for questions. We're gonna stick around for a little while. Um, we have quite a few on the line here, so that shows me that the interest is there and we wanna answer your questions. So Dr. Stanley, go ahead and make the way through the list. All right, yeah, we have some uh, ton of fantastic questions, so we'll try to get through as many of them as we can here. Um, so, and again, some of these I think have been answered, so we'll just kind of focus on the ones that, that have not been. Uh, so, let's see. So, this is an interesting one we can address. Uh, so, this question is, what about studies that have shown an increase in all-cars mortality uh, related to low-carbohydrate diets, um, such as a NOTO paper and PLUS One? Um, and, and, and other studies in epidemiological literature. Do either one of you want to take that on or shall I? I can go, I can at least go first. Um, I think that what you're, I think that what this is referring to was uh, from a lot of epidemiological data um, and I'll share my opinion on this. Um, I think that epidemiological studies are great for hypothesis generation, uh, but are limited in terms of determining a cause of the mortality. Um, and I think that I see that a little bit of that even in the question where, where it's saying that it was linked to all-cause mortality or associated with all-cause mortality, because there's really just no way in those studies to determine cause and effect. Um, and I think we all agree that more research in this area is needed and at Verda we're definitely uh, committed to that. And that's why we extended the trial to five years and also why we established the registry so that we can enable ongoing research among our real world data and answer these longer term research questions that everyone has. Yeah, and I think the only thing that I would add is just, you know, when we look at the interventional studies, um, whether there's some um, randomized controlled trials with low carbohydrate diets, um, or again, or, or with our study, that you are seeing an improvement in, in so, so many biomarkers, and we're not seeing evidence that people are having, you know, increased rates of adverse events. Um, so, you know, I think that the, the epidemiological data is, is interesting, and certainly I think we should, you know, pay attention to it. Um, but again, that oftentimes a lot of those studies are also in the context of sort of a standard American diet, and it can be tough to delineate you know, how, how low of carb they're actually eating or how much fat and what, what kind of foods they're eating. Okay, and then there were a few questions that I can kind of summarize that were around the, the definition of reversal and around, you know, basically asking, what do you consider reversal? And do you consider reversal to be patients who are still continuing to take metformin? Um, and again, that the, the definition of reversal, there's a little bit of disagreement um, in some circles around this. Um, but in, in general, what's been accepted again is this is with lifestyle changes, people who are able to um, achieve and maintain an A1C of less than 6.5%, um, again, without the use of specific hypoglycemic medications. Now, with, again, with regards to metformin, this is used in some cases um, as a prevention of, of diabetes in patients with prediabetes, or again, in many cases, will continue metformin uh, in order to help with you know, again, either blood glucose control, but also some of the other benefits that have been shown with metformin. One thing that I'll add to that is, um, I think I saw another question about, um, you know, do you differentiate between reversal and cure? And I and we absolutely do, and we we absolutely make a different differentiation between reversal and even remission, because um, the the de definition of remission has been sort of um, agreed upon as a consensus uh, in terms of an A1C below 6.5 and maintaining that without any medication at all for two years. And you heard Dr. Stanley talk about, you know, our feelings on metformin and, and why that might be important to some patients. Um, and we pulled out the remission numbers in the two-year paper that's coming out in Frontiers. And I, I don't feel bad about mentioning this because they already put the abstract up online. Um, but at two years, we had 18% of patients achieving remission by the consensus definition of of remission, so A1C under 6.5 and no medications maintained for a one year period of time. So at one year and two years, they met that criteria. 
Okay. Uh, another question is, uh, what is the definition of a very low carbohydrate diet? Do you want me to take this? Right. Dietitian, yeah. take that on. <laughs> so typically, and I, we don't usually use percents here at Verda. We um, start patients out with 30 grams of carbohydrates total uh, for a day and then give them a protein recommendation and, and recommend fat to satiety. And there's a lot of guidance around that. But typically what that ends up being is 5 to 10% of um, calories from carbohydrates, 15 to 20% protein, and the remainder is fat. So I'll give the percentages just for uh, how we typically think about that. So that's a very low carbohydrate diet. But we start at the 30 grams and then we find a person's individualized tolerance to carbs. We're all very different. And this is about sustaining a lifestyle where you feel like you have the options, but you learn to consume what is, you know, what fits within what keeps you metabolically healthy. So we'll work with the patients on determining what that is. Thank you. Uh, next question is, how long will the 400 veterans remain enrolled at Verda without cost to them directly? Uh, and again, so this is, a, um, at this point, it's a one-year uh, commitment. Again, the hope is that this will be expanded in the future to be able to cover uh, more veterans that are interested. Okay, and next question, and this one I think has been covered a bit, but it, it did come up quite a few times, so I just wanted to address it, is, you know, the inclusion exclusion criteria and, uh, you know, just basics of, of how, how people can get enrolled. So again, the age is 18 to 69, and they should have coverage uh, through the VHA. Um, in addition, we uh, want a, a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes um, and on medications uh, beyond metformin. And again, the, the reason for that is that we would like to be able to show the medication reductions in concert with the A1C improvements in patients. Uh, so that is currently the, the criteria. There's not actually an A1C criteria at this point, um, but again, a diagnosis of diabetes is required. Uh, okay, another great, uh, great question is, with low carbohydrate diets, uh, increased fiber, salads, vegetables, um, meat for some patients, uh, may be difficult for some vets to, uh, to afford. Uh, have you found this to be a challenge and how have you addressed it? Yeah, great. I think that's a really great question. So we work with patients of all budgetary constraints. Um, the, the idea here is that this does not have to be a, uh, let's eat all organic and all you know, grass-fed beef and even the source of protein that they choose to consume, whether it be eggs, which can be very inexpensive, or you know, meat for those that do choose that. And then even within that, they're really going for the fattier cuts of meat. So it's actually a little bit less expensive. Um, so it's not you know, simply um, eat all of the protein that you want. It's really a higher fat in fat and restricted in carbohydrates. And then the amount of protein is moderate. So it's actually no change from what the standard guidance would be around dietary protein. Um, but when patients do struggle with um, the idea first, when they're you know, going grocery shopping and trying to um, keep things within their budget, we will talk through them through that. And we actually have resources. I don't even know if I mentioned this, but we have a resource center that is dedicated to providing patients with all of the resources they need, which include education, which includes, you know, articles that we have written uh, explaining some of the deeper science and, you know, how-to guides. And some of those how-to guides are on grocery shopping, grocery shopping on a budget. So we want to arm our patients with um, all of the things that they need, and a lot of that can be found in the resource center. But if it can't, then the coach is there to help them through that. Perfect. Uh, so another question is, in your current study, is there data on safety monitoring? Um, and is there a safety monitoring board looking at adverse events? All of, our, um, all of our adverse events are reported to the review board and are reviewed. And uh, in each of the papers, we've listed each of the adverse events that were reported and they were reviewed and none of them to this point have been um, deemed attributed to the intervention. Um, the other question asked about the, uh, the credentials of the health coaches and how dietitians are involved. Well, I'll take this first. Um, so our, uh, our health coaches are really metabolic health experts spanning all, uh, 
kind of a range of, of credentials from I myself, I'm a registered dietitian and PhD in nutrition. Um, we have nurses on our staff. We definitely have a lot of dietitians. Um, and so uh, they go through an extensive training that is Verta specific, but they're all coming from some sort of science um, health background. Um, all right, another great question here is, um, so I'm surprised that exercise is not a requirement. As a certified diabetes educator, we generally teach that exercise is one of the most powerful ways to uh, decrease insulin resistance. I feel like each of us, yeah. like, oh, Amy, you want to, or Dr. McKenzie, do you want to take it? I was offering, I was <laughs> offering. Um, I, I think, I mean, exercise is definitely a, an option in terms of improving insulin sensitivity. No one doubts that. Um, and I, but I think carbohydrate restriction is a different option in terms of improving insulin sensitivity. There's a study, uh, 10 years ago now, maybe, um, that put patients on a diet very similar to the nutrition therapy that we use at Verda. And they use the gold standard method of measuring, um, insulin sensitivity, uh, the hyperinsulinemic, insulinemic euglycemic clamp method. And after two weeks of following this nutrition pattern, uh, they had 75% improvement. <clears throat> I'm so sorry about my voice. 75% improvement in uh, insulin sensitivity. So I think there are a lot of options and we definitely tailor this. Dr. Volk can probably speak to this better than I can. We definitely tailor this to the patient as well. I will say if patients enter the treatment and they're already exercising, we don't discourage exercise. And many of us, I can tell you, love exercise ourselves. Um, but we, as patients come to us, and they're trying to get their nutrition on point. They're reducing medications and focused on that. And um, they're shifting their metabolism from primarily carbohydrates to fat as a fuel source. We have them focus on nutrition first. And if and when they want to exercise, which typically does happen when patients lose, say, I'm just throwing out a number, but you know, 50 pounds, they feel better, they're, they're, they're uh, they have less inflammation. They have the energy now, that stable energy that they're getting from nutritional ketosis. When they come to us and say that they want to incorporate exercise, that's great. Um, if they use it for, you know, just kind of to clear their head, whatever they want to use it for, great. But again, we're not promoting it as the way to achieve glycemic control. Okay, and then let's see, another question here is a great one was, do you see an overall change in carb sensitivity over time? And I, I would say that we definitely do, uh, you know, over time, and, and what we're able to do is by closely monitoring glucose, testing, and really allowing our patients to do some little you know, tests on themselves to see how they're able to tolerate carbohydrates. Now, if someone you know, has lost 100 pounds, their A1C is now normalized, we very often see, obviously, a huge improvement in their insulin sensitivity and how many carbohydrates they can tolerate. Uh, and then the other part about this that I think dovetails with several of the questions we've received is you know, the question of, do people stay in ketosis forever? You know, is that the goal for the foreseeable future? And I mean, you can see from the, the data that Dr. McKenzie you know, posted that the beta hydroxybutyrate levels definitely tend to uh, trail off over time. So a lot of our patients don't even necessarily remain in ketosis. Um, what we focus on is a level of carbohydrate restriction that allows them to maintain the success that they've achieved. And so, you know, again, by using the testing and by watching closely, um, some people find out that they can tolerate more carbohydrates. And I, I had one specific patient who said, Doc, what I want you to do is figure out the absolute maximum number of carbohydrates I can eat per day without becoming diabetic again. And we, we worked on that with them. So, I mean, that, that, wor that worked for him and, and everybody has a little bit of a different goal. Okay, the next question here. Just to, to reiterate, Amy, what, um, what was the dropout rate at, at one year and then two years? One year retention was 83% and our two-year retention is 74%. And I think um, com compared to other lifestyle interventions, I think this is, is fairly high. There's quite a few studies that compared um, low carb versus low fat and in both arms of the trial, just in doing research in general. We ask so much of participants in research that dropout happens. Um, and, uh, you know, we see low, rates much lower in 55, 65%, um, even just at one year. 
another question that came up was whether the research participants were were paid to, to be in the trial um, and or whether they were paying um, a monthly fee for Verda. Sure. Um, so all of our, our trial went through an institutional review board. So um, they had control essentially over this in terms of our study getting approved. So the, um, the participants were compensated uh, $100 per testing time point at baseline one year and two years. And then in the extension, they're compensated um, $100 at three and a half years and five years for completing all of the testing. And as you can see from the number of publications that we have, and there are more to come, uh, we put them through a lot of testing at each of those time points, um, but that's reviewed by an ethics committee and um, uh, they ensure that that is appropriate to, to what's being asked of the participant to do. And to address the second point, I believe um, they're not paying like a monthly fee for Verda. Uh, so another question here is, uh, are you able to review data from patients' insulin pumps or uh, continuous glucometers? Uh, and it says that many of our patients are using CGM uh, versus uh, performing fasting glucose. And yes, we are. So we're really, you know, say we're kind of device agnostic. So we're able to integrate with a continuous glucometer. Um, in addition, we have quite a few patients that are on insulin pumps and uh, several endocrinologists on staff who really specialize in, you know, our insulin pump patients and in, um, you know, the, the higher acuity patients that we see. Okay. Uh, another question here is, uh, I'm a dietitian new to the VA, and what's the role of outpatient VA registered dietitians uh, with their clients who are enrolled in Berta? So I think, sorry, so I think, um, what's the, what was the, what are the... What would be the role of a VA dietitian whose patient enrolls in Berta? Yeah, so I think we would take over for the day-to-day -day diabetes management. Um, and so for those patients, for again, only for type 2 diabetes, uh, we would take over those nutrition recommendations. Now, whether, you know, and I'd be happy to kind of talk offline because I've talked to a lot of uh, groups that we have launched with who have dietitians on site, and we find that we can really work together. Um, so I definitely love to kind of take this to a later conversation if you're interested um, and see how we can kind of best work together and communicate. Perfect. Um, and then another question here that it kind of dovetails a little bit with the initial question around studies that have raised concerns about low carbohydrate diets, but I wanted to address a couple of the specific concerns here. So the concern was, you know, epidemiologic studies that might show the concern for heart disease risk, um, uh, overloading the kidneys or with uh, worsening existing liver conditions. And I, I think the data, you know, speaks pretty well to this, but data, but Amy, you could sort of dive in. For the, sorry. Sorry, so heart disease risk, which I think you, you could just kind of reiterate, uh, liver conditions and kidney function. Yeah, I think uh, I'll let you speak. I know that we have some exclusion criteria around kidney function. Uh, especially at the later stages. But uh, one thing that I think is really important to reiterate is that this is not a high protein um, nutrition pattern. And that's where a lot of the concern comes from. So we talked about, you know, what is a low carbohydrate diet? And there's all of these definitions out there. Uh, so there's, there's not really a lot of clarity on that. But the, the nutrition therapy that we use is not high protein. And we also tailor it very much to the patient. So I think that um, addresses that component of it. Um, liver, we showed a lot of uh, liver results in our research today. Uh, abnormal AMT, ALT normalized in a significant number of patients and suspected steatosis and fibrosis, uh, the proportion of patients in which that was suspected based on the surrogate scores also significantly was reduced at one year. Uh, so we see plenty of benefit in terms of liver function. And on cardiovascular side, when you're looking at the overall, uh, you know, every single marker of cardiovascular risk that we measured, we measured 26 of them in the study, and 22 of them significantly improved. Many of them did not change, and LDL um, went up about 10. And um, when you look at the whole gamut of, of markers that we're looking at and consider cardiovascular risk as this, you know, holistic, you know, large panel of things that can contribute, uh, an expert consensus uh, group uh, put out a statement saying that they felt that 
considering this you know, overall impact on cardiovascular risk, that the overall risk was not negatively impacted. Thank you. Uh, so another, uh, this is more of an FYI, but I think it's an interesting question here. So it says, just FYI, the, VR, the VA already has a number of outpatient dietitians, uh, pharmacy specialists, health coaches, um, and video connection to other providers um, that's already offered at the VA. And says, so not sure why we would recommend Verda to, to veterans. Um, and I think that's a very good point. And again, I, I have the utmost respect for the care that's given at the VA. Um, I, I think in this case, again, this is a, a small number of patients, 400 patients nationwide. Um, and it's really offering another option for people who you know, want to adopt uh, this dietary approach um, and would like to have the, the connectivity and um, the, the remote monitoring that we're able to do. So, you know, I think it's fair to say if you have specific patients who seem like a really good fit, you know, you definitely can, can direct them to us. Um, but likewise, you know, un unfortunately, there are plenty of people with diabetes um, for, for everyone to, to, to take care of. So I think that, you know, basically we're all want to be in this together and find options for patients that they can adopt. Yeah, I think I will just stress that because I, I definitely, as an outpatient dietitian before this, I understand uh, it can be really hard to see a patient and then not come back for maybe a month, two months, six months. Um, and you want to help them with everything you have. But I think having the connectivity, as Dr. Stanley mentioned, can be really pivotal for some patients. And so I think that it'll be great to really work together uh, to just get as many of that type two population as possible. Uh, and the next question is, uh, I also got a several, several questions around, can I get a copy of the slides or the presentation? And again, we'll be sending out a, a copy of this video after the fact to, to everyone and also be able to provide additional information as people need. Uh, so then the next question is, is it possible now or in the future to be able to train VA providers in these protocols? Uh, and again, this is just another little plug for the uh, ADA uh, webinar that we'll be doing in July to be able to learn more specifically about these protocols. Uh, but what I would say in general is that, you know, there is a big interest in providers now to be able to offer this as an option. And, you know, unfortunately that it's, it's still, I think a, a newer approach. So there's not as much information out there. So we're really working to help push out more of this information and to educate people. Um, because again, there may be patients who don't fit the criteria or folks who, you know, they're not on diabetes meds and maybe just some general information from their, their primary care physician or other providers is enough to, to set them on a path to better health. Um, so we'll definitely follow up with that in the future with, with more information. And we would be happy to, we've talked about doing uh, grand rounds or other in-person uh, visits to, to teach folks a little more about this. All right, so, you know, of course, anyone can drop off. We still have quite a few people on here and quite a few questions. So uh, I've been told that we can keep going. So we're just gonna keep answering questions until people get sick of us or uh, <laughs> we run out of them here. Just make sure I'm not repeating any. A uh, quick easy one for Britt, uh, what are the recommendations for carbohydrates initially uh, starting point per meal or per day? Awesome, yeah, so we let people sort of um, create their meals and the number of meals that they want per day, so I, we don't necessarily say per meal, but um, with the 30 grams of carbohydrates total, that is, uh, they are getting them from five servings of non-starchy vegetables, they're getting, you know, a serving of nuts if they choose, so an ounce of nuts, um, and then uh, the rest is going to be coming from some dairy, you know, a little bit in cream, a little bit in cheeses, as well as those miscellaneous sources like salad dressings and things like that. So that's really their 30 grams of carbohydrates. Protein is going to be personalized to the patient, largely based on their gender and lean body mass. Um, and so we'll give them a protein target to shoot for. And then we guide them around, you know, fat for satiety. So initial recommendations. Okay. Uh, oh, here's a good one. What do you do for patients who absolutely hate vegetables? Oh, I first I ask if they would just add some butter and salt to them, and it'll be you know it tastes totally different. But I also understand. I mean, I have patients that tell me they hate every single vegetable. So we'll work with them and we'll be creative and work on you know okay if you add you know some cheese to your vegetable if you you know we'll work on 
patients sometimes don't even know certain vegetables exist. So we get pretty crafty with our patients. Okay. Let's see. Let me just throw out there while you're looking for another one. You're going to get patients who, you know, refuse to eat a vegetable. Listen, if they say no vegetables, I ask them if they'll do one. And if they really refuse and they tell me that, we'll consider maybe a multivitamin might be best in your future. Uh, so what is the actual cost per patient per year? Do you want me to take that? Sure. If we had a patient that was paying out of pocket, it would be about $5,000 per year. Um, we have a payment assistant plans and all of that. They can pay a monthly fee, but um, it's about $5,000 uh, per year. And then a question here is, uh, do we need ma uh, management or PC pre-approval to give the link to veterans or are they allowed to do this on their own? Uh, so the answer to that is, again, we, we would love the, the okay of primary care providers, but at this point, it's not uh, required. So you know, any, any veteran who is eligible is able to apply on their own. And we are able, then after the fact, we're able to communicate with primary care providers or other clinicians. Um, and again, this was, um, we have sent out a, a, a press release with this and we'll link to that again. Um, but again, it's important to reiterate that this is something that has approval from the, the highest levels of the VA. Um, and so it's something that, you know, you shouldn't get pushed back from your management about. If you have any questions, again, you can direct them towards the, uh, the press release uh, or contact us. Okay, then another question. So this, does the funding to pay for the veterans come through the VA? Uh, and this was addressed at the beginning, um, but basically this is covered completely by, by Verda at this point. Again, this is an initial uh, pilot uh, program. Um, and basically, even though we have the um, uh, ongoing in clinical trial results, a lot of individual organizations and health plans would like to see success within their specific patient population. Um, and we've come across this a number of times. So basically, we, we want to show that, um, that even though the veterans are a very unique population, that they still have you know, quite a bit of benefit from this approach. All right, uh, another one here is, uh, since the diet does not tend to contain fruit, milk, or yogurt, are, are participants recommended vitamin or minimal, uh, mineral supplements? They may, depending on, and once we review their nutrition with them and we find, you know, they're missing some source, but they're often getting uh, them through other sources. All right. Uh, See, some of these are repeats or were covered. Thank you all for sticking with us for an hour and 40 minutes. So there's quite a lot of you on the line still. Uh, the other question that's come up is around, um, again, adverse event reporting and uh, um, uh, safety monitoring. And again, the, so there's specific, there's separate instances, you know, so with the clinical trial, again, we have the IRB approval and um, ongoing monitoring of the, the clinical trial population. And then within our uh, commercial population, which again, in general, we tend to work with at this point, um, uh, self-insured companies and health plans, uh, we have a internal uh, event reporting system, um, tracking of safety events um, and reporting of those events. Um, we also, uh, I don't think Dr. McKenzie mentioned this, but we've actually gotten a commercial IRB approval as well. So patients who opt in um, were also able to collect ongoing safety data, um, ongoing, of course, you know, um, med changes, labs and things like that, and are, um, we'll be publishing on that in the future as well. I apologize. There's a lot to, to uh, sift through here. Uh, oh, here's a good one. Uh, can you remind us uh, what the usual care group that you compared the Verda treatment to in the study um, was? And does it include, did it include individual appointments or calls with registered dietitian or appointments with other providers? 
Sure. So the usual care group, um, these were patients who had type 2 diabetes. They were recently referred to a diabetes education program that was local in the same place that we were in the same location that we were recruiting from in Lockhead, Indiana. Um, so they were referred to the local diabetes education program by their either PCP or endocrinologist. And as part of the diabetes education program, they did have meetings with a registered dietitian or a CDE um, as part of that program. Um, I actually don't know how often we, we didn't touch, the research staff did not um, interact with the usual care group at all. It was just an observational comparison to kind of depict, you know, what does the trajectory of diabetes look like in a, in a similar population from same geographical area, same socioeconomic area. Um, so I know that they did have a, a registered dietitian that they work with, but I do not know exactly how many visits they had or how often they went. Okay. And then there's another question is about how medication adjustments are updated to the VA, uh, since many vets get their medications through the VA. Uh, and again, we are, you know, at, at this point, uh, corresponding primarily through FACS, we're exploring some other options for a better, uh, more direct integration uh, with, with the VA uh, EHR. I know that there are some changes in the pipeline, which makes things a little bit tricky. Um, but again, those, those are communicated through the care team. Um, and you know, again, if, if other medications need to be prescribed, we're able to do that as well. This is an interesting one. This was for Dr. Hallberg, but I think we could answer it as, um, are you aware of any data on beta hydroxy's uh, butyrate's effect on pain levels? Mm. I'm, no. I mean, inflammation, there's a decent amount on inflammation in terms of uh, anti-inflammatory effects, but on um, sensation of pain, no, I, I'm, I'm not aware. Right. Yeah. I mean, I guess I know anecdotally that we certainly have seen folks with chronic arthritis, um, you know, tending to improve. But again, that can be difficult to tease out the uh, inflammatory portion of it or, again, the weight loss portion um, from the actual, you know, nociception. So I was curious if you had any information on that. Let's see. I think we might be running towards the end. <laughs> but again, if you come up with a question after or somehow we accidentally missed uh, your questions. I think we had over a hundred submissions. I don't know, but we had a lot. Uh, please email us for sure. VA providers at vertahealth.com. We'll make sure we get you the answers if we have them. <laughs> Perfect. Should we do a couple more and then call it? Yeah, sure. If there are more, sure. <laughs> Okay, so again, this is another kind of a tough one, but a good one. Um, so saying, you know, with, with patients, um, how long can the strict reduction in carbohydrates be maintained and can it be followed for a lifetime? Um, and, you know, they, there's some concern about the um, statement that diabetes would be reversed and that it's not just controlled with the dietary approach. Um, so what have we seen, I guess, in our, our longer term patients or those who are unable to maintain the same level of carbohydrate restriction? Amy, do you wanna talk about it from the research perspective and then I can add color with our implementation with our patients? Yeah, sorry, I'm reading the question to make sure I understand it. Um, so the, it's a little bit difficult to answer the first part. Um, when the monetary incentive to participate is gone, how long the strict reduction in carbohydrate is maintained? Um, because we, we definitely modify this for the patient based on their goals. And um, Dr. Stanley spoke about that a little bit earlier. Um, you know, as their carbohydrate tolerance improves after they've re regained some of their metabolic health, they have a little bit more flexibility um, and they don't necessarily stay in ketosis. It's not necessarily required um, for them to meet their health goals. Um, oh, can you read me the next part now? <laughs> sorry, <laughs> it missed disappeared. Oh no, I'm sorry. I think it disappeared. Um, yeah. So the question was again, what, um, I guess, um, 
how would you define or would, would you still look at this as being diabetes reversal or is this just diet controlled diabetes if the, um, you know, the patient is unable to keep up the carbohydrate restriction? Sure. I think of this as, I mean, I think when patients achieve reversal, they've, they've reversed the course of the disease in some, in some ways, or they've reversed the symptoms associated with the disease in some ways. I think, especially when Dr. Stanley was talking about um, patients may get a, an A1C below 6.5 um, but we don't necessarily remove metformin because we appreciate the fact that they are definitely still at some amount of risk. Um, and But given that we see the carbohydrate tolerance increase over time after they've regained that health, um, I think that also speaks a little bit to um, the, the improvements in insulin sensitivity that they've made. And, and that's also been studied in research uh, in terms of the, the amount of insulin sensitivity that can be achieved just in two weeks of starting this uh, type of nutrition pattern. But I just to point out, we do recognize that it's about maintaining the reversal and working with the patient on their individual needs of what it is in their life that they need to work on. It's not always just the nutrition. And so we're gonna continue to work with patients. And that's actually why part of why we ask for that one year commitment from patients, because if you think about the things that you go through in, a, in the course of just a year, I mean, from birthdays to you know loss of a loved one, so many different issues, we wanna help them maintain the reversal through all sorts of things that life throws at them. Okay, another uh, good question here. So who uh, says, who is funding the research currently being done by Verda? Um, and that is an excellent question. So, so Verda Health is funding their, their research study. Um, you know, and obviously we wanna always address potential um, downsides or things to be cognizant of. And, and certainly we know that com conflict of interest um, is an issue that people bring up. Um, you know, in, in addition, even though this is an interventional trial, it's not a randomized controlled trial. Um, however, you know, a big focus in this throughout has been to, again, prove that this treatment is safe and effective, you know, to do this under an IRB to do this under a university and to, to show the ongoing results and to try to be as transparent as possible. You know, there's a lot of things in healthcare now, obviously, that um, are big claims, um, but a big part of, of where we've started from the beginning is to try to, to publish ongoing data. Um, you know, if you have concerns about the applicability or uh, how reproducible this is, again, I would direct you, there's actually quite a number of randomized controlled trials uh, using low carbohydrate approach, uh, both in metabolic syndrome, obesity, um, and uh, with type 2 diabetes as well, uh, that show pretty consistent results. All right, I think last one, Dr. Stanley. Uh, let's okay. see. Sorry, I'm not having a hard time keeping up with even dismissing them after we do it. There's so many good ones here. Um, You know, I think we covered all these. The other one, the only ones that are left are, are kind of reiteration of prior ones. Okay, great. Well, thank you all so much. Um, we look forward to working with you in the future, uh, hoping to see you on the ADA webinar. Um, and again, if you have any questions, please direct them to us. We really appreciate your participation today and your interest of Verda. So hopefully together we can help even more veterans and keep doing what you're doing because we know that you're making a huge impact and we hope to, to kind of help as well. Thank you all. Thanks so much, everyone.